If you would have asked a European about 1600 AD how old the earth was, he would have told you about 6,000 years as from the biblical account in Genesis. You can call before the 1600s a pre-scientific period or era. With Galileo's findings through his telescope, he was converted to the Copernican theory of everything in the solar system revolving around the sun and not the other way around, which is what we know to be true today. This later gave rise to a number of field geologists who in the late 1700s and early 1800s, through their excavations and observations in finding evidence of different layers of the Earth's strata, the remains of dinosaurs of different types here and there, led them to believe the Earth was much older than the literal six days of creation spoken of in the Genesis account. With the rise of this scientific data about the long geologic periods and ages becoming more and more common knowledge, this had to be dealt with by theologians and preachers alike. What were they going to do? Scientists were observing how the volcanoes had created mountain ranges. Even ones long dead could be studied. The strata were showing long ages of sediment which meant water had been brought in or displaced over several periods with different types of sediment over millions of years. They were seeing the physical evidence and showing it to the world. Theologians and preachers were having to come up with something to deal with this mounting evidence. They then introduced what is called, in the Genesis account, a gap between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2. They were touting that there had to be a gap of time inserted here. There are several different variations of this theory, but essentially the proponents of this new doctrine explained that in verse 1 how God created a perfect heaven and a perfect earth. Now somehow the earth's condition had changed from verse 1 of perfection to the condition of being devastated and void of life as stated in the first clause of verse 2. Then darkness came upon the waters in the second clause. How did this happen to God's perfect creation? Enter the rebellion of Satan in heaven. Revelation 12 tells us, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. from verse 2 and forward then describes a week of days that some say are about reconstructing the ruins and the entrance of Satan into the universe and into this world. Some describe this as making and forming of the earth. Either way, let's see how they justify this gap, what the objections are to it, then take a look at a solution to the conflict brought about by this theory. 
first page of Genesis, which is God's holy word, the scripture states, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Because God created the heaven and the earth, it is seen as a perfect creation. But humanity cannot often see nor can it understand what God's glorious purposes are for. What mankind deems as acceptable behavior by a loving God, especially in today's incendiary climate of woeful propaganda, which we see pushed by the media and some preachers, is not the God who is portrayed in the pages of scripture. This is seen as foolishness in his sight. Know this. In evaluating anything put forth by science or mankind in general, we must first measure it against the canon of Scripture and not vice versa, as it is so often done today. Many of those that would have you to believe in a gap theory would explain it in this way. Look at the evidence in verse 2. Some kind of chaos had to change God's perfect creation from verse 1. Then they will use Isaiah 34 and verse 11 as proof the judgment came from God. Because this verse shares two of the same Hebrew words with the first clause of verse 2 in Genesis, which says without form or tohu in the Hebrew, and void, which is the word bohu, tohu means desolation or it's worthless. The Hebrew word bohu means empty void, or you could think bleak or barren. It is not a world at this point that can sustain life. Now in Isaiah 34, verse 8 tells us that the Lord's vengeance and judgment is upon his enemies. So let's read verse 11. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. The English word confusion here is tohu, and emptiness is bohu. To justify their theory, then they say, see, judgment is on the earth at this point. They carry on their justification of this theory with the second clause of Genesis 1 verse 2, which says, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Darkness naturally lends one to think of in biblical terms of blackness, iniquity, sin, wickedness, evil, the devil, and Satan. We already read and went over Revelation 12 in the intro, so this is why they say judgment must have been on the earth at this time. To further justify their claim, they use the Septuagint, which is widely accepted by most scholars to be the best translation of the Hebrew into the Greek. They point out that these translators use the Greek word for, but, as the conjunction, rather than as we read it in the King James. This additionally creates a separation from verse 1 and verse 2. To further still promote their way of thinking, they turn your attention in verse 2 to the English word was, which is haya in the Hebrew. At this point, we need to stress that the English word was, or haya in the Hebrew, can be, under certain circumstances, translated became correctly, as will be shown later. Gap theorists rely heavily upon this translation to support their claim. We will verify in the interlinear Bible of what is called, or what is called the Textus Receptus, which is also the received text, later. This shows the original Hebrew and Greek spelling, so this will remove all doubt of any mistakes and verify the truth. Remember, the gap theory is all being done to harmonize the biblical record of God's creation to solve and explain the problem of time in the scriptures. Geologists have presented their evidence with mountains of scientific data. You have to then think also that people at this time were associating science with evolution because about this same time, Charles Darwin was promoting his theories as well. So to supplement what they had already seen to show you in the Hebrew words, they also quoted certain passages to add to their claims like in Ezekiel the 28th chapter where Satan is pictured in the garden of God. With Satan being shown there, 
Automatically, most would assume that this is the same garden as that of the Eden in Genesis 3, where Satan tempted Eve with the apple. We'll go into more detail about this shortly. In the last study, we looked at another verse gappers like to use, which is 40, uh, Isaiah 45 and 18. At this point, because God did not make the earth to be in a state of void of Genesis 1 and 2. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. It's obvious the Lord did make the earth to be inhabited. They use this to say clearly God did not create the world in vain, which is again the Hebrew word tohu, as again this supports their claim that some kind of ruin or Satan had to be cast into the universe between these two verses. There were a lot more verses that they use. We will look at one more in Genesis, the first chapter. Let's look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. It does give the idea of a refill, doesn't it? This is what the gappers rely on. Now these are the basics of what they use to support their theory. This had a tremendous effect on a lot of preachers in that time that taught this as it was also popularized by the Schofield Bible in the early 20th century. The first thing that should strike anyone as odd or strange about this is that it leaves only one verse, and that being Genesis 1-1, talking about God's original creation. All the rest of the chapter is about reconstructing. Some want to call it making and forming from the entrance of Satan into this universe. This recreation is usually supposed to have taken place a few thousand years ago. Some think God created this in literal 24-hour periods. Some think a day and then an age. There are all sorts of scientific data as well as opinions. These theologians and preachers want to tell you. I used to believe it as well, but I was shown a couple of months ago that the theory has a lot of problems and faults with it. So I had to rethink my stance on this subject and we will get into that in the next section. There are a large number of these so-called Christian scientists and guys that write books and articles on the gap theory. One thing I notice when reading all these books is that they all go back and quote from this one guy. So instead of reading all these books, I found a copy of the original 1955 book titled The Christian View of Science and Scripture by Bernard Ram. I'm going to quote Mr. Ram's book as the knowledge in here is outstanding. We will start on page 201 where Mr. Ram is responding to a guy named Mr. Rimmer who he pairs with Pember and Schofield of the Schofield Bible. At this point, he is talking about the and, which in the Septuagint translates as but. He goes on to say that the English, the Hebrew exegesis of Genesis 1-2 cannot be adequately maintained on two grounds, grammatical and interpretative. The and of Genesis 1-2 is the Hebrew wa which is used in so many thousands of instances that it is difficult for the author to understand how anything important could hinge on it. A word that has such an enormous usage simply cannot be squeezed into such a definite meaning for this one verse. 
He goes on to discuss the word was, which is the Hebrew word haya, as we went over earlier. The effort to make was mean became is just as abortive. The Hebrews did not have a word for became, but the word to be did service for to be and become. The form of the verb was in Genesis 1-2 is the call perfect, third person singular feminine. A Hebrew concordance will give all the occurrences of that form of the verb. A check in the concordance with reference to the usage of this form of the verb in Genesis reveals that in almost every case, the meaning of the verb is simply was. Granted, in a case or two, was means became. But if the preponderance of instances the word is translated was, any effort to make one instance mean became, especially if that instance is highly debatable, is very insecure exegesis. Now, let's remember what the gap theory was formulated for. It was to match and even counter what science offered, in particularly geology, which was giving an evidence of data that the earth was much older than previously thought. He goes on to say in the next page, the interpretative objection is this. The entire interpretation of geology and Genesis is made to hinge on secondary meanings of two Hebrew words. To indicate that in some cases, wa may mean but, and that haya means became, does not give us full warrant to insert these meanings in Genesis 1-2 and require all geology to conform. What he just said is what the gap theory set out to do is exactly opposite of what it actually does. It requires the evidence found in geology to conform to the gap theory, which makes the Bible have to do gymnastics with its words and conform to their exegesis. This has just been shown to be very thin exegesis in this light at best. Even Arthur Pink, which surprised me a lot, translated Haya to became in his book, Gleanings in Genesis, which was copyrighted in 1922. I really like Mr. Pink's writings, but in this instance, I believe he translated this wrong, as well as others who preach and teach this doctrine. Now, this is not a personal attack on anyone. This is a correction of the doctrine. Are we not to do as Paul told Timothy to do, which is rightly divide the word of God? As Mr. Ram has shown grammatically and interpretatively, this cannot be proper exegesis of this verse. Let's look at why this is true, specifically this word became, uh, being haya as was stated earlier. I would like to look at a translation. Let's, so let's take a look at a place where it can be translated that way. In Genesis, the second chapter, verse seven, the scripture reads, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This word became in the English is the Hebrew word haya. It is correctly translated here, and I will confirm this another way here shortly. It is also obviously implied here as well. You could say man was a living soul, but it doesn't really fit grammatically here, does it? In Genesis 1-2, this is not the same situation. Let me show you why. To be translated became, haya has to have a preceding wa, or vav, which is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it looks like this. Let's look at another example where haya is used as was in Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. This word was, in the English, is again the same Hebrew word, haya, the same Strong's number 1961. So what is the difference? In the first place, you would not say, now the serpent became more subtle than any beast of the field in the context of the way this verse reads here, would you? No, absolutely not. It doesn't even sound right. It does not have the preceding wall. 
of the Hebrew and its spelling. Let's check out the spelling in the interlinear. If you will notice the way Hayah is spelled here in Genesis 1-2, which is the word was. I don't expect you to know how to read Hebrew. That is why I am also showing a different spelling of Hayah in chapter 2 and verse 7, which is the English word became. This spelling, which has the preceding wa, is spelled correctly. Genesis 1-2 does not have the preceding wa. For me, this is the nail in the coffin to trying to translate this word became. It cannot be done. If you want to exegete this properly, in the English that is, I'm sure there are a lot better Hebrew scholars out there than I am, but as I said, this does it for me. Without Hayah being able to be translated became instead of was, this whole house of cards called the gap theory comes undone. This is proof positive unless you are just a person that wants to argue with anyone or anything such as a door. Well, usually the door wins and it doesn't say a word. This is proof positive and proper exegesis of scripture. Jesus said in Matthew 5, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Well, you also cannot add to his holy word either, not even a wall, which is what you have to do for this to be translated became in the English. Even the translators of the Septuagint did not translate the word Hayah into became. They translated it the same way the King James did, which is correct. So what does this mean? The Hebrew words tohu and bohu do not necessarily represent some type of judgment was on the earth because of Satan's fall that was between these two verses from Revelation 12. Doesn't a potter start off with a lump of clay or a sculptor start off with a block of marble? That is all verse 2 is saying here. The rest of the universe was just as the earth was at this point, void of any life. It still is the same way now. Only in the third clause, the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters of the earth, is what the scripture says, isn't it? Nowhere else in the universe is it ever said that about in any of the scriptures. As a matter of fact, it's still in darkness. We find the same pattern of darkness in John 3, speaking of this world spiritually. This is why Jesus said we had to be born again because men love darkness rather than light. We, as his elect, have to be brought and shown his glorious light. Now in part one of the series, we were shown parallel verses about the darkness in the book of Job as well as Psalms. There is nothing in the scripture, not one parallel verse or parallel passage to support a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. As for Ezekiel the 28th chapter, talking about Satan in the garden, let's read that starting in verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Notice here that there are no trees, no animals of any sort, nothing so far as we would say living and breathing. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. There is nothing of substance to suggest that there is any reason to lead anyone to believe. You can just insert this passage between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1 based on what we just read. Some want to tell you that the rebellion also happened after the sixth day. 
I disagree with that as well, and we'll show you shortly when I believe the timing of Satan's fall was, as well as the entrance into this universe. As for Genesis 1 and verse 28, and the Hebrew word replenish, this is the Hebrew word male, which means to fill and be satisfied. Even in Elizabethan or King James English, it meant the same thing, which is to fill completely, not to refill. The gap theory is the wrong way of looking at this subject of the Bible and science. As been, has been stated, it only came about when geology started showing that the earth was considerably older than had been supposed. There are various reasons for this. One of the most common and obvious mistakes is not looking thoroughly enough in the original Hebrew for the answers. They were grasping for straws is what the results show. The gap theory breaks the structure of Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 up as well as the rest of chapter 1. It leaves the original creation to just one verse alone, which makes the whole theory suspect at best. Let's take another look at this Hebrew word, haya, for a moment. Any lexicon will tell you that this is again in the perfect form, as Mr. Round noted. The perfect form usually means that it is in the past tense or it is in a completed form. We see that it is not completed until the 31st verse. The gap theory was actually a knee-jerk reaction by theologians and preachers of that time to not having an answer from the Bible that was satisfactory for them to show God in a manner that they could attract the masses that had gone after the new religion of science back into their churches again. They were trying to put themselves in a position to accept no real responsibility while at the same time to show God in a positive light, if not much more diminished though. Hence the view of the infralapsarians and the free willers are the same. For those of you who are not familiar with the term infralapsarianism, let me take a moment to explain it to you as it is not a common term. The infralapsarians want to describe God as being positive and negative or active and some call it a permissive aspect of God's decrees which relate to sin. This is the view among the majority of believers in, in predestination or Calvinists as well as Reformed Baptists and it is a definitive point as how they see the view of supralapsarianism as inconsequential. They don't want you to perceive or look at God in a negative light as well as not seeing that God made Satan the way he made him to tempt Eve or that he made mankind to have a sin nature on purpose. Oh no. The, they cannot have God to be cast in a light like that at all. I like what Paul Karras wrote in his book, The History of the Devil and the Idea of Evil. In the section of Satan and Israel, he writes, in all the older books of Hebrew literature, especially in the Pentateuch, Satan is not mentioned at all. All acts of punishment, revenge, and temptation are performed by Yahweh himself or by his angel at his direct command. So the temptation of Abraham, the slaughter of the firstborn of Egypt, the brimstone and the fire rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, the evil spirit which came upon Saul, the pestilence to punish David, all these things are expressly said to have come from God even the perverse spirit which made the Egyptians to err, Isaiah 19 and verse 14. The lying spirit which was in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab, 1 Kings 22 and 23. See also 2 Chronicles 18, 20 through verse 22. Ignorance and indifference are directly attributed to the acts of God. I'm going to skip down a paragraph now. It is noteworthy that Satan in the canonical books of the Old Testament is an adversary to man, but not God. He is a subject of God and God's faithful servant. 
These guys that only want you to see God in a positive light use the Hebrew word bara in the first verse of Genesis describing the heavens as perfect. It sounds real good to their congregations. God did make a perfect universe, but it is perfect in his eyes. Let's look at another verse where create or bara is used in a different manner and hardly ever brought up because it shows God in a supra lapsarian view, but which they find inconsequential, remember? I forgot to mention this word lapsarian is how mankind lapsed into sin or fell from grace. Infra, inferring God just letting it happen. Supra, meaning God is the cause of mankind to lapse into sin. Do you see the seriousness of the two opposing sides? It's much more than inconsequential. The softer or infra-lapsarian is much more motivated to have a lot of people coming through the doors of the building to pay all the bills as well as supply all the money for those high dollar suits and those ties those guys wear. The cars they drive, all that. I believe the super-lapsarian is more motivated with the saving of souls while teaching God's word in fear of him. That is what this ministry is about, as God has supplied another ministry to pull me out of my sin at God's appointed time. Lord willing, he will do that for others with this ministry, if it be of his will. Now let's get back to Isaiah 45, the same chapter we were in earlier, but we're not going to go into verse 18. This time we're going to go into a verse that again uses the Hebrew word bara. This word only applies to God and his divine nature as he creates all throughout scripture like in Genesis 24. It is used to say how God created man and woman. That being said, now let's look at how God is sovereign over everything in more of what the infralapsarians and free willers would say in a negative light when we read verse 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. This whole passage is a prophecy about how the Persian king Cyrus would serve God to bring Israel back to their own land. God is showing his absolute sovereignty over everything and does what he wants for his reasons, even creating darkness and evil. They serve his purposes. Let's look at another example of this in Amos, the third chapter, in verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? These guys hate it, these kinds of verses that show God using his glorious power in whatsoever way he deems fit to use it. All the nations of the world are counted as nothing. Let's look at another verse back in Isaiah that reinforces what I just said in Isaiah 46 and verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient time the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Some folks will tell you that that's just the Old Testament God and he was always killing someone over there. Jesus said, he was the I Am, or the Jehovah of the Old Testament in John 8. In Ephesians, the first chapter, the scripture speaks of Christ in verse 10, which is how we are able to have an inheritance. And here also, he works all things after the counsel of his own will in verse 11. Now, if you are still here, you are just starting to get an inkling of who the real Jesus of the Bible is. Now you see who you are dealing with. This is the God whom you had better fear because in Ezekiel 18, he said all souls are his. These examples are not even the tip of the iceberg as to who God is and how God works. Why then should we be shocked that Satan tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden? Why should we be horrified by an infinitely powerful being that does as he pleases and says none of humanity is any good whatsoever? The world hates predestination, yet he calls it his way to salvation, justification, and glorification. 
most of mankind is going through the wide gate that leads to destruction, and he even says it in red letters. Few are even made to go through the narrow way that leads to life. So when was Satan cast out of heaven and thrown into this universe? Look at the results of science that show God's handiwork, not nature capitalized as if something holy like these scientists want you to believe. That's garbage. Mankind has a sin nature, yes, but it does not come from Adam and Eve eating the apple. That was the acknowledgement and results of what we are made of. Calvinists tell you that babies go to hell when they die because of our sin nature, but they haven't come to the knowledge of good and evil yet, so how can they sin? They don't have the mental acuity to think yet. How can they sin? They cannot know sin at this point. The soul that sins, it shall die. Once we get to old enough to understand the knowledge of right and wrong, good and evil, mankind goes straight for sin. Gap theorists will tell you Satan was put into this universe between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. The evidence points to before that. Scientists tell us that 99.73% of this universe is dark and made of dark matter. What is the picture of hell? Doesn't Jude 13 say the blackness of darkness is reserved for the ungodly? Didn't Jesus say that he beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven in Luke 10? What are the four physical things that were mentioned by scientists that started at the beginning of creation? Time. Space. Matter and energy. What is lightning? Pure energy. I am putting forward as for the timing of God having Michael and his angels throw Satan into this universe. It's from the beginning. I can't tell you how he did it. I wasn't there. But if the stars are not pure in his sights, and we know that he created the heavens in Genesis 1-1, then God used Satan from the very beginning to corrupt this whole universe, much less the earth. God did not say the darkness was good. He said the light was good when he divided it from the darkness in verse 4. This universe was corrupted from the beginning, not in any supposed gap. It was done before time was time. We've already seen and proven legitimately by the spelling of the Hebrew words as well as grammatically and interpretatively that there is no gap. We are made from corrupt matter. It was corrupted when God had Michael throw Satan out of heaven and into this universe and in this world. That is why we have a sin nature. Yes, God made a perfect creation, but it was a perfect creation in his eyes not man's. Nothing is outside of the way that he wants things done. It was never chaos, like Dante wrote. Everything has been made by him in his perfect order and in his perfect timing. Doesn't Proverbs 16 and 4 say, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. The Lord made Satan the way he did for his reasons and to accomplish his purposes. Do you think it was a surprise to God when Satan rebelled? <laughs> Not in the slightest. God made Satan the way he did from the beginning to rebel. That was his purpose because the scripture states in Malachi 3 that God does not change. In Psalms 89, David asked God, Wherefore? hast thou made all men in vain. This word vain here in the Hebrew is the word shav, and it means evil or in the sense of desolation or desolating or literal ruin. Why would God hate Esau before he was even born and love Jacob before he had done any good or evil? You may not like 
and probably don't like this viewpoint. But what it does answer is all the questions of the Bible and science, along with the assumptions about Satan with the gappers. Seems rather obvious to me. It fits with the scripture without inserting anything into the text. Men just don't like it, but that makes God to be a God to be feared always. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord over there in Psalm 112. Does that make God malicious or hostile? Ezekiel 33 and verse 11 states, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die? O house of Israel. What that does is make God holy and righteous while dispensing His grace and His mercy to whomever He wills. He chose Israel in the Old Testament. The elect are spiritual Israel now and who He chooses in the New Testament. You have His Word in the Bible right in front of you. He is telling you and showing you what he will and will not tolerate. Repentance is a gift, and now that you know what is required, what are you going to do? I know what I have to do. I have to repent every day. What does Luke 13, 3 and 5 say? I tell ye nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, is what the scripture says, and I believe it. Do you? Do you want to hear the words, guilty, pronounced by him at the judgment, or well done, good and faithful servant? Do you have the seed of righteousness in you or not? If it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, go serve the master of yourself. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord now and hopefully he will have me later. I've never heard anyone say this, nor have I ever read anyone remotely go near this conclusion on the timing of Satan's entrance into this universe. Call me crazy if you want. But this is what the evidence of God's will points from a strictly and pure, uh, purely scriptural standpoint. That's what it looks like to me. Let me know what you think without cursing me in the comments and I'll post them or you can give me a call if you have any questions. Thanks for watching.